Hello. Um, probably give it another couple of minutes for some other folks to join. Give it another uh, minute or so. I think a few folks are, are, um, are starting to hop on now. All right, uh, we're five after, uh, we can probably get started. Um, so just a reminder here, um, uh, so um, uh, one second here, yeah. uh, okay. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, supply chain working group meeting. Um, as a reminder, uh, your, you know, uh, this meeting is recorded. It'll be uploaded to YouTube um, shortly after uh, this meeting um, ends. Uh, we will also, uh, and also your participation in this meeting um, uh, must abide by the uh, CNCF's uh, code of conduct. Um, today, I believe uh, we have somebody giving a presentation and uh, uh, I'll have uh, Aradna um, introduce. Hi, good morning all. Um, so a few weeks ago, I had shared a blog post from AWS, which talked about number of services um, that can be utilized to build a CI CD pipeline and build security into those CI CD pipelines as well. Um, and that blog post was written by Srini Manapalli, who is on the call today. Um, I had gotten 
a request from this team to invite him to come and speak to us about his blog as well as all the security services that can be natively used in um, AWS um, to build a secure CICD pipeline and also secure our supply chain, software supply chain. So over to you, Srini. Please take it away. Um, if you're talking, you're on mute there. You're on mute, Srini. <laughs> Okay. Yep. Sorry. So hope uh, you all can see me now. So I was trying to turn on my camera here. So yeah, again, thank you, Aradhana. Thank you for involving me here. So I um, appreciate the opportunity. I also have uh, Das Debashis from the AWS. He's interested to participate in this one. Like, you know, so he's helping me with this. So um, just want to introduce him as well. So um, yeah, you want me to get started with the presentation or anything before that? No, you can start with your introduction with the presentation. <laughs> okay, yeah, absolutely. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a senior solutions architect here at AWS. My primary focus is uh, DevSecOps, uh, particularly at AWS. But before joining to AWS from last two decades, uh, close to two decades, I have been working in various organizations, helping them build DevOps implementations and the security implementations and uh, application performance monitoring. So all the nine yards of uh, infrastructure setup. So uh, I have a good background of DevOps and the security. So that's why like, you know, recently when Aradhana reached out to uh, present about the recent blog. So I was, it's an exciting thing. So definitely I'm looking forward for this one. So with that, uh, I will share my screen. trying to find, I don't see the screen share button here. Maybe the permissions. Should be at the bottom. Um, I Green don't... arrow, no? It, uh, anybody needs to give me some permissions to share my screen here. So, oh yeah, I see it now. I see it now. It just showed up. <laughs> Not like Amazon Chime, right? <laughs> it's <a bit> different. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, I'm sharing my screen there. You should see the uh, PowerPoint slide deck there. Can can any of you confirm? You can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, oh, awesome. Okay, so uh, today, uh, as Aradhana mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, the recent blog, which was published, like, you know, recent means sometime in July, uh, which is about uh, building an entry and Kubernetes based DevSecOps software factory on AWS. That's a solution we'll be talking about, but I'm happy to answer any questions or anything uh, beyond that one. So, uh, uh, the, for this talk, uh, this is the architecture, by the way, we'll be talking through. Uh, so we'll talk about how we implemented security and compliance in this pipeline. And then we'll jump into the, the pipeline itself, the flow, how it is doing the security and compliance into the pipeline. So let's start with the security and compliance. So when implementing security and compliance in DevSecOps uh, uh, software factories, there are two aspects we will address, right? One is security of the pipeline and the security in the pipeline. That's the same approach I took uh, when building this solution. Um, so security of the pipeline is just to set the stage. Security of the pipeline is about protecting your pipeline itself. Security in the pipeline is basically making sure whatever you are pushing through your pipeline is meeting all your security and compliance requirements at the end product, right? So uh, how, do we, how did we implement the uh, security of the pipeline? So when talking about security of the pipeline, there are many aspects to that. So some of them are you know, authentication and authorization, encryption, patching, uh, alerting and monitoring, uh, then key management and configurations. These are all various aspects we can enforce into the uh, uh, in the pipeline so that uh, uh, the people who are supposed to do some activities uh, in, in like, you know, whether they are uh, doing some activity in the pipeline, like, you know, whether initiating the pipeline or changing something in the pipeline, they have the proper authentication and authorization. 
Similarly, the data that you are um, uh, generating in the pipeline is encrypted at rest and in transit. And uh, coming to patching, like, you know, you will use so many tools and services in the pipeline, right? Making sure it has all the up-to-date uh, patches and doesn't have any vulnerabilities in there. So, and then moving on to alerting, logging and monitoring is like, you know, we all know it's uh, monitoring and observability are the key components and also auditing is needed, right? Some for some of the compliance requirements, whether you take FedRAMP or any of those, you need to go back and present some kind of uh, auditing capabilities to the uh, authorizing officials. So that's what we are talking about. And then if you are using any keys, whether to encrypt or to sign the artifacts, it's not just uh, using those keys, right? We need to protect our keys, how we are producing those keys and how we are like, you know, encrypting the data. So we need to have proper key management. That's what we are talking about here. And finally, the config management is if you have some sensitive information, like, you know, API keys, passwords, or any parameters that you are passing in this pipeline, making sure we are properly uh, managing those configurations, not hard coding in the infrastructure as code or anywhere. So these are the certain aspects. So um, uh, the, how did we implement this into this solution is basically using the infrastructure as code. So there are many solutions for the infrastructure as code. So uh, because we implemented this on the AWS side, cloud formation is one of those options. So uh, all the previous slide components, whether it is authentication authorization, generating the keys or encrypting certain components, uh, all those are incorporated into the uh, cloud formation template basically. So that's what we use here. And then moving on to the security in the pipeline is making sure your code is meeting all the security and compliance requirements. So these are some of the uh, aspects how you can achieve that. But this is not a, a the complete list, right? Beyond this, there are many other ways you can protect your uh, security in the pipeline. So uh, implemented secret analysis. This is a very basic thing, right? So we make sure the sensitive information is not pushed to the production workloads. So that's about secret analysis. And the software composite analysis is basically looking at your third party dependencies and making sure no vulnerabilities that's also implemented in this solution. And then the static application uh, uh, security testing is basically looking at your own code and making sure it is meeting the code quality requirements of your organization. And then doesn't have, you're not incorporating any vulnerabilities into your code. So that's a SAS. And DAST is basically, um, looking from the end user point of view, uh, making sure like you know, once you deploy, you expose the URL and uh, make sure all the security vulnerabilities are identified from the end user point of view, like SQL injections, cross-site scripting, some of those. And finally, we implemented runtime in, uh, application self-production using like you know some of the open source as, tools as well, which is RASP. It's like finding out the abnormal behavior or unusual pattern in your production workloads and take some action related to that one. So these are some of those, but you have any many other components like IaaS or like, um, many other components you can include into the pipeline security as well. So how did we, uh, if you take all those components, uh, this is the different stages in the pipeline particular to this solution we implemented. For example, secret analysis and security review, you can incorporate in the build, right? As we all know. And then moving to the test, uh, once you deploy to your lower environment, like staging or uh, test environment, you can do the DAST analysis and identify the vulnerabilities there. Then once you deploy, let's say you deploy to production, you can use the RASP. Uh, in this case, we are using RASP to identify any abnormal behavior in your production workloads. This is how uh, those previous slide uh, security in the pipeline components will span out in your pipeline. But uh, so yeah, to implement these, um, uh, we used leveraged open source tools for all of these aspects. Um, so we'll talk about what are the tools we used and then how we did we achieve that. One. So uh, uh, another component we are talking about security and compliance is that's the key piece why we are implementing security. So let's, for example, if you take a, an example of NIST standard eight, eight, uh, 853, then it has 20 um, control families and each control family has so many security controls. So the solutions and the services that we used are, this is like, you know, we mapped so that, you know, each control family 
will address with these particular resources. For example, on the right side column of each table, I listed some of the cloud formation template resources. So those are the components. Similarly, if you use Terraform or any other things, you can identify those resources and help whoever is implementing, uh, make their life easy, basically. That's the uh, whole purpose here. So this is how you can achieve security and compliance your requirements. Right? So moving on, um, now let's talk about the pipeline itself, the flow and how we use the open source tools and all that. So these are the high level services we used. Uh, left side, if you see, those are open source tools. Some of these vendors have commercial offerings as well. For example, if you take Anchor or Sneak, uh, they have commercial offerings as well, but we used open source uh, in this solution. So Anchor or Sneak, for example, they can do this SE and SAS. There is a little overlap there. So they are doing like an SE and SAS. And coming to DAST, we used OWASP Foundations, OWASP ZAP, which is Z attack proxy, to uh, do the uh, black box testing from the end user point of view. And finally, coming to RASP, Runtime Application Self Production, we used CNCF uh, Sysdig Falco to identify the abnormal behavior. So these are the open source tools we use. And coming to the right side, those are the AWS services uh, we used. Uh, for example, KMS is like, you know, for generating the cryptographic trees. And the security hub is a, um, like a single pane of glass, basically. You have the, all these vulnerabilities uh, scanning tools here, uh, but uh, we need to find a way to make life easy for uh, uh, end users, right? So are the security persons or the operations so that if you identify some vulnerabilities, for every vulnerability, you don't need to go to each of these tools and uh, like you know see what is the vulnerability, how do I remediate. So, we are providing a security uh, like you know single pane of glass with the security hub basically. So that's what. And Amazon ECR is a uh, repository config, and under the hood, it also does uh, uh, container scanning. So that's why uh, that's been used in this solution. And CloudTrail is. Uh, like, you know, we talked about the auditing, right? So that can help in this solution. So basically all the activities that are going in your uh, pipeline, it records, and then you can take actions on top of that. Then moving on to config is like, you know, to meet security and compliance, obviously uh, you need to enforce certain rules and evaluate those rules continuously to make sure you are still under the compliance. So config can help, AWS config can help in that aspect. And if you recall, uh, we are talking about the config management, right? For security of the pipeline. So AWS SSM parameter store is the one where, like, you know, for example, you generated an API token in Sneak uh, or uh, Wasp Zap, like, you know, the, the, the key to authenticate yourself. So those are the ones uh, we are storing in the parameter store so that, you know, you're not hard coding all those pieces. And finally, on the AWS IAM side is for the authentication and authorization. So to enforce that. And uh, Amazon Git Secrets is uh, another open source tool um, to analyze the secrets such as uh, you can do the passwords and also you can identify uh, like you know, AWS access keys and secret keys and you can customize that. So this is the overall tool. Just want to introduce that so that you know, we know what we are talking about in the next slides. So then moving on, um, and obviously you need to build tools, right? So we have Jenkins open source tools and Circle CI or Bamboo, there are so many tools. Similarly, AWS has these tools. These are the ones I used in this solution. Code commit is a um, code repo and code build is a um, continuous integration service, like similar to Jenkins, you spin up and do the build and package. And code pipeline is basically like an orchestration, like Jenkins, you can think to stitch together all the different stages. So uh, coming to the DevSecOps pipeline architecture, um, let's say we are pushing a user, uh, pushing a code, then it pushes to code commit, which is a code repo. And then that basically, triggers a CloudWatch event in this case um, uh, to initiate the pipeline, your pipeline. So code pipeline in this case we are using and that triggers various stages of your pipeline. So for all the packaging and testing in this solution, we are using code build, but you can replace with like, you know, Jenkins or any other open source tool 
but this is the basic idea here. So we are using code build to do the building and testing and the deployment aspect as well. So uh, let's say once pipeline got initiated, you trigger the first stage, the code build, and that does the secret analysis of all your uh, code. Does it have any passwords or any sensitive information? or any Amazon secret keys or access keys. So if there is anything, the build will fail, obviously. If not, it move on to the next stage where the another code build instance will kick in. And then depends on the tool that you choose, whether you have an option to choose either Anchor or Sneak, then it loads the tool, downloads the tool and performs that scanning against your code. And if there are any vulnerabilities, let's say, then in this case, uh, what I'm using here is a Lambda function, which is written in a Python. It's a very simple Lambda function. Uh, what it does is it takes the report from these uh, vulnerability tool, depends on which tool you choose, and it aggregates that and pushes it to Security Hub. So in this case, we are using Security Hub, but you can, if you have any other tool, like a, to give you a single pane of glass uh, view of all your vulnerabilities, you can push it to that tool as well. So that's what we are using Security Hub to give the single pane of glass. And also storing that report in the Amazon S3 bucket, or you can store it in any other uh, storage for, uh, for, for your future reference. For example, if you want to go back and check the entire report uh, of the vulnerabilities, then at least you have some auditing capabilities behind the scenes. And let's say if there is no vulnerabilities identified from your code, then it moves to the next stage and creates your container image and pushes it to ECR, which is the container repo we are using. And that also has inbuilt a scan using a clear open source project. So that also um, scans your container image, uh, goes through all the vulnerabilities. If there are any vulnerabilities, then it calls the Lambda function. The same process repeats. The Lambda function aggregates the vulnerabilities and pushes to Security Hub so that the operational person doesn't need to go to the ECR to see what vulnerabilities are there and all that. So the same process repeats. If there are no vulnerabilities, then obviously it deploys to a staging environment. In this case, I'm using EKS, which is a, again a CNCF uh, certified Kubernetes conformant, but doesn't need to be EKS. It can be any open source uh, Kubernetes environment. So once you deploy there, um, then you are now able to do the DAST analysis using WASP ZAP open source tool. Uh, and if there are any vulnerabilities, again, the same process repeats. So the idea here is the operational person doesn't need to go into log into each of these tools. So that's the basic idea. And then triggers a Lambda function, pushes it to security hub, stores the report in the S3 bucket. So if there are no vulnerabilities, then now let's say if uh, you are deploying a sensitive workload, you need to have some kind of a manual approval then it triggers a email using Amazon SNS in this case to the approver, whatever the approver email address you have provided and sends them a link. Everything is good, no, no vulnerabilities identified. Now can I go ahead and deploy to production? So let's see if they approve, then it goes, to uh, goes and deploys to production. If they reject, the build will fail, right? So it deploys to production. Um, so that's the complete flow here. Um, so the final one is, uh, because EKS, when you set up, you can deploy Falco um, and you can uh, look for the unusual activities in your uh, Kubernetes environment, right? So in this case, Falco is monitoring and identifying certain events. Like for example, if somebody is logging into your Kubernetes environment, which like, you know, not supposed to be doing those things, then Falco will capture based on the rules you uh, integrated into your uh, Kubernetes environment as a sidecar. And then in this case, I'm sending alerts to CloudWatch, but you can send it to like you know any other um, log aggregation tool, and then like for example, um, Splunk or any any other tool, and you can inform the operation teams and take the remediation actions on top of that. So uh, another just uh, components here, we talked about parameter stores to store the sensitive information of the configurations there, um, and. Other compliance requirements we are getting using like, you know, um, uh, AWS IAM, AWS Cloud Trial and Config. So do, I'm just calling out there. So that's the uh, entire flow of this architecture. 
Um, and we talked about the security hub giving a single pane of glass view, right? So this is how you will see, for example, if it is identifying any ECR vulnerabilities identified in the container, then you will see ECR, the first one. Then if it is any the vulnerabilities it identified from the SAS, uh, which is Anchor or the Sneak, then it reports. Similarly, the DAST, which is OWASP ZAP in this case, reports here. So that we have everything in one place. So, and you can extend this to take the automatic remediations. Like you can call a Lambda function from here. If this is the CVE that I got, this is how I want to address, or I this is how I want to patch. So you can take it to the next level to remediate automatically. So um, yeah, you can dig into those details and see what vulnerabilities, what information it has, all that. So does this solution cover the entire security that we are looking in the software supply chain? Uh, no, no, because there are so many other components, right? So many of the projects CNCF is also working here. Um, so we can extend this solution to bring like, you know, uh, artifact signing and verification and enforce policy as code, like, you know, using OPA and uh, gatekeeper and all that. And based on the recent cybersecurity order, we need to create the S-bombs for the government workloads. So you can integrate open source tools to create S-bombs and analyze those S-bombs. And also like, you know, um, we need to include the metadata attestation and verification like in an in total project. Um, so that is also can be extended to this one. Um, and also we can integrate automatic th threat detection like, you know, with the uh, other um, solutions out there. So these are the, uh, the ways we can extend these solutions um, and bring like you know, some of the goodness that is happening in the CNCF like, you know, projects that I mentioned, like you know, Intoto or uh, OPA and all those projects. And also like, you know, um, we can, uh, from our side, we can bring the customer experience also to feedback to these projects to see uh, how can take these projects to the next level as well. That is an option there. And then, um, so these are some of the common challenges we normally hear from the customers when implementing the DevSecOps. Uh, for example, we talked about the security and compliance, right? Uh, so basically, if you are implementing the government workloads, uh, DevSecOps for the government workloads, then you need to achieve ATO, authority to operate, and be continuously in that uh, authority to operate. So uh, that is not an easy thing. For example, you talk about FedRAMP high, DOD, SRG levels uh, five or uh, like, you know, four, five, six. So those are not easy to implement. Um, so uh, those are the basic big challenge we see when customers are trying to implement that. And again, we all know there are like, you know, dozens of tools out there when implementing the DevSecOps uh, factories. Uh, the biggest challenge is how to stitch together all these tools together or the frameworks together and build an end-to-end -end software factory, which covers all the requirements of uh, the individual organization. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, you, that requires a lot of uh, uh, skill sets and a lot of knowledge in different areas, security, dev and operations and many other aspects, right? Um, and unfortunately there is no easy solution. Okay, this is the solution. You can do the entire NP and DevSecOps factory with all the security and compliance. Unfortunately, today we do not have anything as a DevSecOps community, right? So hopefully, in future, we will get there and help uh, um, uh, the organizations who are building DevSecOps to easily build those solutions. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, we talked about it requires range of skill set, right? So, um, so, so finally, just want to call out. So, these security software factories are very complex, and uh, uh, it's it's not easy to implement all the security and compliance. So my goal, my primary goal, like, you know, from last one and a half year is basically how to make it simple so that, you know, even the small organizations, the small teams also can take advantage of these uh, software factories and able to produce uh, uh, secure uh, softwares at the end. Because if you make it, if it is too complex, the so small teams and small organizations may not be able to take advantage because of the resources and availability of them and the size of their teams. So um, then 
those organizations end up with softwares which are not completely secure so so how can we make it simple yet secure so with that i will uh, end the uh, presentation but please bring up if there are any questions or comments Srini, if you could bring that slide where you had the integrated architecture. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, um, I mean, from an admissions controller perspective, is there one point of enforcement or decision of all these controls? Or you, you are doing it incrementally different controls at different stages, right? Yeah, these are um, like, you know, if you see uh, how we map these secure controls, each of these addressing certain security controls. For example, uh, it's you can call it incrementally uh, for the security in the pipeline. For example, all these different tools, each of these tools are mainly targeting about risk mitigation, right? So how you are producing your secure software uh, product at the end. But the security controls are also needed at the security of the pipeline. That is not incremental. It's one shot. You are uh, implementing like you know, using infrastructure as code. So in this case. Um, so security of the pipeline is in one shot, but security in the pipeline is, you can say, incremental. Does that answer your question, Aradhan? It does. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of continuous compliance, like you said, continuous um, ATO. Um, mm -hmm. So have you built any solutions like that where you, you can provide that assurance to government entities? So uh, that is a tough question, right? So um, uh, so unfortunately, like, let's say if uh, organization is looking for a uh, continuous authorization, like an ATO, um, so we can help them. Each organization is different. Each organization solution, how they want to implement DevSecOps is different. Um, so uh, once they automate all these certain security controls, for example, security of the pipeline and security of the in the pipeline, then you have higher chances to be in continuous ETO. That's the only way. Uh, to so that you know you can assure your authorizing official there is no manual intervention whatever we are doing uh, in this pipeline is through the automation and through different security gates if you give that confidence and the documentation to the authorizing official i think those organizations can be in cato uh, without much efforts every time they go through the review but yeah, we, there is no uh, one solution for that one. So they, they need to automate to the extent possible so that they can be in CATO. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out if you have reference customers who have implemented it, right? Um, conceptually, yeah. theoretically, it is possible. But practically, what the challenges are, I think that's where enterprises kind of struggle, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of customers on the AWS side ask for that, but yeah, unfortunately, there is no one answer for that. So, understood. Yeah. So, I have a quick question. Uh, could you go into more detail about the the deployment step into production? Uh, you said it's a manual approval, and then you're using you know, the notification service right to email. So, what happens after that? Like, is there a trigger that gets you know once the approval comes in? I guess. Yes. Does it yeah. trigger the build? So is that a manual step or is that an automated step also? It's like, for example, in this case, the approval email goes back to the approver is an automated process. 
So let's say if code build, uh, like when all the security scannings are completed and no vulnerabilities, then it triggers an automatic email and uses SNS and sends an email. So approver can uh, log into the console because to approve, he needs to see certain data, right? Okay, are there any notes? Because you can add some information in the email saying that, okay, all these checks are good. Now you can approve or you can say, okay, all these checks, 90% of the checks are good, but 10% are failed. You can maybe attach the report and then say, okay, do you want to still go ahead and approve? So risk is low. So that kind of information you can provide. Um, and uh, once they log into the console, they can see the data and they can say, okay, approve or reject. So that's a manual step. To approve or reject, it's a manual step because they need to review the data. And once they click on review, uh, like an approve, then again, the next step will be automated. So it will go ahead and deploy to production in this case using like a you know, uh, kubectl or what. In this solution, we used kubectl, but you can use uh, any other ways of de uh, deployment. And you said a cloud build is, is this Jenkins in your case or is it something else? No, no, code is build AWS is a, specific. Code, code build, I'm sorry, yeah. A, yeah, code build is a managed Agent. service by AWS. It's a, okay. similar to Jenkins. You can like, you know, just to give you connect so that you can connect, I compared with Jenkins, but it's a, it's a completely managed integration service. What it does is it brings up a um, uh, compute instance under the hood, uh, similar to Jenkins worker node. And then mm -hmm. whatever the build commands you pro, uh, provided, it runs those build commands. In this case, let's say you are creating a container image and storing it to ECR. That's the script you can provide, or you can run cube cup cutl commands to deploy to your Kubernetes environment. So those are the ones. So when you say approve, so is that like a, a sort? Of, I assume there's some kind of a UI. I haven't used code build myself. So I'm not sure, but so I, is there like a UI or something that you just click on like, hey, this is where the pipeline is at right now. You had to, you click on approve and then it goes on to yeah. the deployment stage. So production or? yeah, code build does the scanning and sends the email. That's the end of the story for the code build uh, in this case. Then the up email will have a link to the AWS console where you can see the pipeline activity. So they log into the AWS console and uh, see the activity and then they can review, approve or reject. Does that make sense? Code build is basically yeah. behind the scenes doing the, all the build activity. Yeah, Parth, to, to the, that question, it's actually a part of code pipeline. It has a, a resource that's I actually see. like a manual gate you can put in place is what it's called. And, and it, it is, it's a separate, just logic gate. Yeah, exactly. So it's if you not don't part of code build. Got it. Yeah, it's, okay, it's not, got it. Yeah. If you don't want a manual approval, you don't want the, that uh, gate. So you can take out and do the end to end automation. So, understood. Thank you. Yep, yeah, no problem. Great. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Like, you know, I can share this uh, slide as well. Um, so it has uh, references to the blog. So yeah, please hit me if you have any questions. Hey. I'm more than happy to, to talk to you. Uh, hey, Shwini, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you already referenced this, but the Amazon Git Secrets piece and the, 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 the second code build run, uh, is that not public? It is public. So this is an open source uh, project. Uh, is that the question that you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What's it called? Is yeah, it it's an Amazon, Amazon Git Goods? Secrets. It should be in the GitHub. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, on the AWS lab side. Cool. Got yeah, it. Yeah, AWS lab. It's similar to Truffle Hog, like, you know, um, so you can look for all the uh, yep. things to information. Yeah, now the next step, what we are trying to do is like, you now we are um, uh, the metadata analysis. Yep, please go ahead. Yeah, hey, so the only other thing I was going to ask was on the use of Security Hub. Um, what is the ability for you to put these custom results in Security Hub? Do you, do, you, do you happen to be able to show what that looks like? Yes, so this is the Security Hub uh, console. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like a security posture management service. Um, yep. What you can do is Secure Hub provide, let's say you have uh, AWS accounts. By default, it gives a capability to enable PCI um, uh, vulnerabilities in your account or PIA vulnerabilities. It looks at multiple data sources behind the scenes um, and then look for the vulnerabilities and reports it here by default if you enable. On top of that, we can do like you know, custom integrations like I did here. Like I'm sending the vulnerability report from my vulnerability scanning tools to Security Hub. So that's another extension you can do. And also Security Hub also gives you some additional integrations from some of the tools. Some of them are open source, some of them are partner. Yeah. For example, uh, you can go there and just integrate. Okay, I want to receive all the security vulnerability findings from uh, Fortify. And as long as you give that endpoint, Security Hub can go and fetch all the vulnerabilities and show it here. So real quick, the, these insights, they're not actually like alerting, alerting uh, on, on the fact that you have vulnerabilities because that wouldn't, this is, this is so that you can actually reference some sort of artifact that you've stored via Security Hub. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, you can, uh, if, you are, if you can push it to here, you can... Yeah dig down to each of those vulnerabilities and see the details. And if you want to alert, you can send an alert. And if you want to even take it to the next level and say, if this is the vulnerability I found, then I want to remediate this vulnerability by calling a Lambda function or some other script. You hmm. can do that, uh, you can do that uh, as well. Could you, could you also do this on the side of uh, guard duty, creating a custom finding in guard duty and having, you know, you can create CloudWatch event rules that trigger off of guard duty findings. Yes. Um, if you did want to set up an alerting system. Yeah, guard duty findings also, you can find it in the security hub. I think that's the recent feature uh, we released. Yeah. So the okay. guard duty, you can also send the findings here. Cool. Yeah, this way, like, you know, it takes away the heavy lifting from the operations teams, right? So if you have 10 different security scanning tools, you don't need to uh, log into each of those tools to identify all the vulnerabilities. And again, you need to figure out how to remediate each of those vulnerabilities. So this is one of the ways uh, we can like you know, take the heavy lifting from the uh, operation teams. Uh, one more question. Is there plans from AWS to start integrating, you know, like the signing verification, attestation, all that kind of stuff, you know, all those kind of tools into uh, some kind of a feature in AWS? Um, AWS has a tool called AWS Signer, uh, but it doesn't support all the aspects of the signing. Like, you know, for example, if you want to sign containers, currently it doesn't support. Um, so uh, I think that is in the roadmap, but I'm not sure at this point when that will be released. Uh, but you know, uh, we can use uh, like an, if my plan is if you are building solutions like this, um, whether it is an open source tool or AWS tool, whatever it fits well. For example, Sig Store, uh, Google Sig Store, we can use right so uh, to sign the artifacts. So uh, whatever the customers feel comfortable or the community feels comfortable. Right. So. No, um, this is great. I said, um, still absorbing all the details here. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the opportunity here, but yeah, yeah. Hit me up on LinkedIn or anywhere. So I'm happy to uh, answer any further questions and we want to take this uh, similar solution to the next level by incorporating like, you know, other uh, CNCF projects like you know Intoto and Six Store, so uh, so that you know AWS customers can take advantage of uh, projects like, uh, like um, metadata analysis as well. So it's in the pipeline. Hopefully, we'll get there soon. But yeah, yeah. And hey, Srini, is is this uh, is is there like an AWS Labs repository that you guys are gonna release that would have you know, basically an infrastructure as code way of setting this up. I mean, there's nothing preventing anybody from 
creating a reusable CloudFormation Absolutely. template to set up exactly this. Absolutely. This is uh, released as a, uh, like, you know, in the GitHub, the entire solution is there in the GitHub. Um, okay. So, yeah, I can share you the link, like, you know, this is, uh, yeah. This yeah, that link cool. will be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. This is a blog and it has links to GitHub and all that. We are trying to convert this into workshop as well so that, you know, if people want yeah. to do that, you know, they can do themselves. So, absolutely. Great. Cool. Thanks again. Thank you very uh, much. Any, yeah. 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 I was just about to ask you yeah, if anybody has any other uh, final questions or anything. All right. Um, if not, uh, yeah, thanks again. And um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I believe this is the last meeting for the year. I'm going to double check with the leads. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll double check with the leads, but but I'm pretty sure this is the last meeting of the year. Um, and as far as stuff that uh, that's still in progress, so um, I still haven't heard back on when the draft of the reference architecture is uh, going out. Um, I believe I believe it's supposed to the the draft of the secure software factory uh, reference architecture is supposed to go out either end of like you know in the next week or two or very, very early next year. But um, I'm gonna check back with Brandon and Andres uh, to, to, on the status of that. And um, yeah, any other uh, topics or anything else that folks wanted to bring up? All right, cool. Uh, if not, um, if we don't have any uh, meetings, uh, I want to wish everybody a uh, happy holidays and a happy new year. Um, and I'll hopefully see all of you in the, in, in the new year. And you can all have 12 minutes back. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. See you guys next year. Bye -bye. Thank happy you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, I will wait for the slide.